Hi, welcome to another episode of MYD Global. I'm your host, Leanne hackman Cardi. Do you think that when a disaster hits, it actually hits women differently than it does men? Well, according to Lorena Aguilar, who's the Secretary General at Flaxo in Costa Rica, she believes there is. And I'm talking to her today about what her perspective is and how she believes impacts on women need to be taken into consideration in the preparedness, response, and recovery phases of disasters. So stay tuned. Hello, Lorena. How are you today? Hi, fine. Thank you. Before we get started, can you just tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Well, I am an anthropologist. I am a Costa Rican, and uh, I have devoted my whole life on working on inclusion, um, gender equality, and sustainable development. Got into this uh, as a young girl, uh, I take it, uh, the interest in women in, in disasters or, or gender studies in particular? Yes, very, very young. Um, actually, when I was um, studying, in the University of Kansas, believe it or not, I was interested in environmental anthropology. Nobody had coined that term. And I started looking at environmental anthropology and understanding that the um, environmental problems were basic human-driven uh, problems. And that women played um, an incredible role when it came to solutions, but also were impacted in a different way. And I'm talking that this was in late 80s, uh, where, um, I'm sorry, early 80s, when people were not still grasping the terms of sustainable development. And then I had the honor and the privilege to be invited by IGRC in Canada to be one of their young professionals. And that's how I got involved on gender issues, because uh, the work with IGRC was on the first water decade. We have had many water decades, but in the 80s, the first water decade in which we start framing, moving from what was called women in development into gender and development. And I was with IDRC for 10 years. And then I had this crazy idea that uh, the environmental sector had to really embrace these principles. But when we started, we were quite alone. I mean, people thought like, really, environment? No, 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 no. I mean, uh, think about people was already a challenge. And diverse people was even more challenge. So, yes, I started working on these issues uh, since the beginning of the 80s when it was not a cool topic. Uh, nobody was uh, looking at it. And it had been quite a ride for more than 30 years. Uh, to really try to bring gender uh, in the environmental sector. Tell me just in, in a basic way, so women, when a disaster happens, whether it's natural disaster like a hurricane or a flood or, or even COVID, um, how, how would you say, what are some of the impacts that would be different for women? I think that the first thing that we need to understand is the role of gender gaps. Uh, women face uh, disasters uh, from a different position. Uh, they, for example, do not have the same access to education. So it's difficult to understand sometimes the messages that you get. Uh, you don't have access um, to land tenure and to a series of assets that makes you more resilient when disasters happen. And I can give you a good example. When Mitch stroke uh, Honduras uh, many years ago, there was this woman in the coast of Honduras and her neighbor come and tell her that there are winds of 260 kilometers coming. And she said, how much are 260 kilometers? She has never driven, not even a bicycle, forget about a car. So it didn't meant anything. And then they didn't have any information on what to do when a disaster of this type was going to strike them. So they took a very a bad decision that was to work, walk by the Stuarium. She had three kids. Uh, one tied to her chest, uh, and then the water from the ocean came, and the water that was coming from the mountains came. And she got into a tree. She was there for three days. She was captured. She lost two of her kids in that process. 
take to a refugee camp and her words were, you know what happens to a single mom and she was raped. And then she came back um, and her house was made of cardboard and zinc. There was nothing left. And this NGO came and told her that uh, she didn't have to worry. She just had to provide them with only one thing, her land tenure rights. So Doña Vera said, um, disasters affect us in a very different way. Those countries where gender gaps exist, the ratio of death is four women to a man. And in those countries in which the gender gaps are less, because still there is not a country in the world in which gender gaps had been closed, uh, the same amount of women and men uh, died. So I think the essence of when we work on disasters, uh, has to be closing those gender gaps. There is not a better solutions and preparedness that we can take that is precisely closing those gender gaps that makes women more vulnerable, um, not because of their sex, because of the marginalizations that society has produced on them. Just thinking there's so many models out there on how to engage communities and preparedness planning and exercises mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. How can we incorporate women in these models more effectively? Well, you have different entry points. Um, it has to be at the moment that you are developing the policies, for example, that they're gender responsive policies that acknowledge these elements and take actions toward closing those gender gaps. Sometimes it implies uh, building the capacity of women so that they can have a meaningful participation. And I can also give you an example when I have been working on climate change and you see the women without providing them with the knowledge associated to climate change. For example, talking about red. Red is a mechanism for reducing emissions from degradation and deforestation. But women think that red was a color. And they said, what? So if you don't prepare them uh, to understand uh, what the processes, what the policies are, what the projects are, what the initiatives are, it's not about counting warm bodies um, when they are, that's not participation. How can they fully understand? How can they fully engage? And they also need to be engaged not only as vulnerable women. I mean, we are not only pregnant, poor women in the South. We are agents of change. How can you catalyze these incredible, powerful women to really have uh, that role that they deserve uh, to have? So as I said, there are many, many different entry points. You also need to make sure that they have the conditions to be able to participate. I mean, are, how are they going to bring along their kids at the time, the way that you convene them? Um, so there are all these elements that need to be taken um, into account. And of course, listen to them. Um, be able to capture their needs, their thoughts, and their solutions, because they have incredible ways of doing it. So is there anywhere that you can think of, whether it's in Costa Rica or elsewhere, uh, where, where women's voices are being integrated successfully in this area? I will say that there are initiatives in, in various countries. I cannot say that there is a country that is doing it in the perfect way, but there are very interesting initiatives that are happening. For example, in Bangladesh, after the biggest... Um, Flops uh, that they had, uh, they started uh, developing the capacity of women to maintain the infrastructure associated to uh, disasters. I mean, where they can go, they were managing, they had the systems prepared. Uh, we have, for example, because I'm a girl plan international that is trying to bring the voices of young girls um, into um, disaster preparedness and disaster relief. I think that also a good example was some years ago, the International Red Cross, uh, which was at that time, talking about the 90s already, more of a um, relief organization. And they started working more on the development of these uh, capacities and they developed these national processes to really work on the preparedness, not only on what has to be done at the moment that the 
disaster strikes, but how do you prepare everybody to really know what to do and how to act uh, during those times? And what is very interesting is that um, projects that have done that have seen uh, that not that many people die in respect to other countries that, that have not uh, done it. So there, I, I will have to say that there are many efforts uh, that are being trying to do. And lately, we have found some very interesting examples. For example, in Fiji, uh, there is a group that is working with LGBTQI community. Because uh, during um, the disasters, uh, people from LGBTQI communities were not allowed to go into the refugees um, because they will transfer their sickness to other people in the community. So there, as I said, I mean, different ways of addressing it, uh, different ways of taking care of that. Um, special people with disabilities also need to be uh, taken into account. Uh, this intersectionality between if you're an older woman or you're a younger woman or you're a disabled woman, uh, what are going to be those special needs that needs to be taken into account during the prevention part, but also during the disaster in the reconstruction as well? In your work, what are some of the things that you're working on right now in this area that that uh, people should know about? <laughs> So well, we're, we're working very hard with different countries around the world because uh, right now the countries are developing their national determined contributions. These are their plans to combat climate change. And they have a lot of mitigation activities, but definitely under adaptation, we have the whole work that is being done on um, disasters. So we're really helping countries to understand why it is important and how to do it. But also now during COVID, I think that uh, we're working very, very hard on this just transition to a greener economy in which some of the elements that I have just uh, told you are essential uh, to build more resilient uh, communities. I think that COVID has shown us that the path of development that we had was not the correct one, that was not inclusive, that it didn't took into account diversity. And even though the whole world is affected by COVID. There are some of us that are more affected uh, than others. Women working in the informal sector that have not been able for months uh, to go out and, and sell their products. Uh, when you tell people to confine in a house, uh, it's not easy if you live in a slum and you have to walk uh, for water. And you have 10 people uh, living in 10 square meters. How can you confine? So access uh, to health. Who yeah. has access? I mean, your country and my country, we have socialized medicine, but that is not the case. Um, what are the rights of people for uh, health? Uh, is it a human right? Is it something that all of us needs to have access? And COVID is a disaster it's yeah. that we're facing. Uh, the first of its kind in which the whole world has been affected, even though climate change was here first than um, COVID. But I think it is important to learn that uh, we need to rebuild and we need to rebuild back better. And that uh, needs uh, to include everyone in this process, acknowledge their needs, acknowledge their differences, but acknowledge as well um, the role that they can play in this uh, construction of the world. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, was there anything else you wanted to mention that perhaps I didn't ask about? Yes, I think what is fundamental, um, as I said at the beginning, is that we are 3.6 billion solutions. Uh, this is what we are. And to think about... Um, the reconstruction of a greener economy to deal with climate change, it will be illogical to leave this power behind. And we are incredible agents of change. And we have shown to the world that without our inclusion, probably that is one of the reasons that the path of development that we took was not the correct one. 
Well, and that's a great way to end. So uh, I, I, I love your challenge to include everyone in the solutions because we all bring such different things to the equation. And I think women are, are um, predisposed to thinking about future generations and leaving the place a better place. So um, I, I wish you well in your work. And thank you, uh, thank you for taking the time to, to speak with me today. Thank you for talking with us uh, and thank you for letting our voices be heard. Thank you.